Welcome to the Shotgun Journal. Join me, Bruce Scott and Marty Fisher, as we travel to the untouched, virgin, arctic region of Canada to hunt the white grouse of the far north, the ptarmigan. And in our great gun companies of the world segment, we're off to the land of pounds, princesses, and big men, London, England, the land of side-by-sides and over-and-unders, to visit a very innovative and respected gun maker. If you own an over-and-under, chances are that the design for that gun came from this company, Boss and Company. Graham. Bruce. May I introduce Graham Halsey, Managing Director of the Boss and Company. Graham, I just told the viewers that uh, chances are if they own an over-and-under, the design came from Boss. Could you elaborate on that for us? Sure, Bruce. Prior to 1909, there were several over-and-unders but they were big, bulky, not typically reliable. Um, and it was about 1909 when John Robertson filed a patent that then became known as the first recognized light, reliable, single trigger over and under gun. Think about this a moment. When they originally started making side-by-sides, they simply turned the barrels this way, used the actions that they were familiar with. Now the problem is it became very thick, bulky, and heavy. Now what Robertson did was take the trunnions and move them up on the side of the action and that's how he was able to get a slim, sleek looking over and under. Now over the years, Boss has made the decision not to be a high production company. They try to focus strictly on quality. That's right, Bruce. Uh, and we try to keep it down at no more than 20 guns a year. Wow. And since 1909, we've only built 400 over and unders in total. Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing some of the guns. Sure. Well, let me introduce you to Tim, one of our senior gunsmiths. Another thing that made the Boss over and under so popular is they had developed a single trigger that was extremely reliable, and they put it in their over and unders. Now, they got a reliable trigger by using a rotating turret. And now we're going to have Tim explain that single trigger mechanism to us. This is the single tur turret here, single trigger turret. This long bar that runs along here is the Barclay that actually cocks the turret. When you fire it, it like that, and then the whole turret lifts and that fires your second barrel. Hmm. On opening the gun, you push the lever this way, and as you see, the actual turret is rotating, you see? Just there, rotates it. That's cocked now, and then when you close it, it's ready to go again. So on opening the gun, the gun cocks, ejects the cartridges, you close the gun, the lever closes automatically, and you're ready to fire again. Well, I'm sure that in that day, there were some very unreliable yeah. double triggers. Yeah, and yeah. I've had a side-by-side uh, -side double on me a time or two, and it's not fun. Well, this action is a little 28-gauge action. Now let's take a look at a 12-bore pigeon gun. There you go. Now this pigeon gun was made in 1938. A unique point about this gun, because it's a pigeon gun, it was made without any safety work right. at all. So the gun is live as soon as you close the barrels. It's ready to fire. It has additional locking pins inside the locks, so any of the smaller pins can't work undone under load. Uh -huh. Because they used to place such heavy wages on pigeon shooting. Sure. And you know, there was great money gambled on it. They wanted ultimate reliability. And the other thing, obviously, because it has no this is a single trigger gun as well. It reinforces the reliability of the single trigger. Well, you've removed part of the mechanism, the safety mechanism. Exactly. So it adds to the reliability of the single it trigger. It makes it simpler. It takes one of the aspects away. Right. But the, our single trigger is known so it's safe and it will not double discharge. But this chap is obviously a very serious pigeon shooter. Well, reliability will be extremely important when you have a lot of money on the line at a large pigeon shoot. But now we'd like to take a look at a boss side by side. That's beautiful, isn't it? This is a typical Boss single trigger game gun. This is made in 1930. 1930? 1930. It's in exceptional condition. It, it has had a new stock put I on would it. say so. That's a nice long stock. Yeah, it's a stock very long stock waiting to be made off for yes. length. Yes. But as you can see, it's showing a lot of original colour. Yes. And it is in pretty good condition. You won't get much better condition than that, really. Now, one thing that Boss was known for was their they call it a self-opener. Can you explain the self-opener just a little bit for a us? A self-opening system. On a boss, the self-opening system is contained 
inside the action here. It, right. is, a, it is a an extra leaf spring on either side of the gun, which right. work on the cocking limbs. So as you open the gun, it assists in cocking it. So consequently, it's a, it's been given the name of self opener. Okay. 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 So as and then you oh, open, oh, yeah, Oh. Almost opened itself. Yep. Now that's not totally true uh, once it is fired, is that correct? Uh, no, because what, what happens is also on a boss, when the gun is opened, but when it's not fired, the ejector work is continually decocked. Right. It only stays in the cocked position once the gun has actually been fired. Right. So th these would be compressed down right. further because our extract, the, way, the means of cocking this is these run down the face of the action. The extractors run down the face of the action. One of the things that also makes the guns very desirable is the fact we're only slightly over our 10,200 number series since we actually started in 1812, of which there are probably only 6,000, perhaps 7,000 guns that have actually been assigned numbers. All the other numbers would have gone on extra barrels for guns. So you could have had gun number 10,000, 10,001 could have been an extra set of barrels for it. So consequently they're very rare in terms of other English gun makers. 200 years. 6,000 guns. That's the reason that boss guns are revered by double gun collectors and shooters worldwide. This week the Shotgun Journal has traveled to the land of the caribou, musk ox, black bear, and the white bird, the ptarmigan. And getting here was quite an adventure too, Bruce. First we flew into Montreal, then we took a two hour flight almost due north to the Inuit region of northern Quebec. We landed in the village of Kujwak and then took a twin engine otter which deposited us right next to our Diana Lake Lodge site for this week's exciting wing shooting adventure. And joining us today is Al Stewart and his English setter Hunter. Now Hunter is just a one year old dog so don't expect that finished dog work that you see sometimes on the shotgun journal. But it is a perfect place to bring a young dog and expose him to a lot of birds. Whoa, whoa, look at Marty. Birds. Man, what a surprise, Bruce. Man, that was. Come on down, there may be more. I'm coming. Two birds dead right here. Be ready down here, Bruce. Birds up. Oh. Oh. oh! There we go. Oh, good <laughs> shot, man. Now, the other one went in behind all those trees, and I had no shot whatsoever on him. Well, there are more birds down in here. We've got a natural block here with this lake, so. Well, Marty, Marty, Marty. There you go. <laughs> Jeez. Hey. Man. They told us that these birds would flock up in uh, groups of eight to 15, and I think we just hit a flock. It's uh, probably a family group that yes. they're talking about. And yeah, um, yeah I mean, and there may, you know, for all I know, there may be more in here. Good shot, Bruce. Okay, let's just move up into here. There's a couple of those birds that landed up just between here and the treetop. Yeah, those came out of that last flush also, did they not? There's bird. Bird, Marty, you're a bird. Nice well shot. done. I guess it's pickup time. Yes, it is. All right, Hunter. When I introduced Al earlier, I didn't tell you the full story. Al is the Upland Game Bird Specialist for the state of Michigan. And no need in me trying to explain the willow ptarmigan to you. We'll let Al tell you about the snow grouse. This, this willow ptarmigan is one of the most common of the grouse in the world, actually and it's found up in the Arctic and through the tundra. And it's such a beautiful bird with the white wings, right. cryptic colors. This bird in the winter will turn all white. They can really just fit in with their surroundings. Perfect camouflage perfect for all camouflage. seasons. The other thing about the willow ptarmigan is, is the feet. And this is what really differentiates ptarmigan from other grouse, is that the feet are covered with uh, feathers all the way down to the edge of the toenails and up the legs. And in the winter, these feathers grow even larger and longer and actually act as snowshoes that allow the grouse to uh, walk on top of the snow fairly easily. The willow ptarmigan is the largest of the ptarmigan and it has uh, black tail feathers 
And something unique also to ptarmigan is that the upper tail cover, it's this brown color here. Right, very long. Uh, very long. Actually covers the whole top of the tail feather. And it, so it covers up these black pieces. Right. They are beautiful birds. Oh, they're just so beautiful, so beautiful. Well, earlier I called it a snow grouse. And that's because it is actually of the grouse family. That's correct, yep. It's, uh, now you told me earlier that this uh, uh, willow ptarmigan is as close as you can get to the red grouse of Scotland and uh, the British Isles. Yeah, right? actually the, the red grouse is lumped in with, with the uh, species of uh, well, willow ptarmigan. That's correct, yep. Well, I'll tell you, I'm thoroughly enjoying hunting these willow ptarmigan. Well, today we're going to hunt the ptarmigan a little different. Number one, you'll notice that we've changed dogs. I call this fat camp dog. But, you know, that dog probably has more experience on ptarmigan, spends every year up here. It's a Brittany named Diane. Well, she eats well. There's no yes. doubt about that, <laughs> as we have as well. Right. But what we've done, we don't want to do all our hunting right around the camp, even though there are a lot of birds right around the campsite area. So we've actually gotten a boat ride a couple of miles north up Lake Diana, and we're going to work our way back toward the campsite. This is excellent ptarmigan cover all along this lake shore. So we're going to see if we can pick up a few birds, have a little bit of luck. Absolutely. All right, there may be more in here. Probably are. Well, I think Diana loves to hunt these birds. Once they fall, she don't want anything to do with them. There she's coming back. Just wants to go get another one. Well, we've only walked maybe 100 yards from where the boat let us off, and Diana ran ahead of us. We were yelling at her. Come up over this little rise, and she's up here on point. <laughs> and as we established earlier, these birds typically are in family flocks, so there's a good chance that there may be a few more birds in this thick stuff, so we'll work it and see if we can get something out of here. All right, birds down. Got more birds on the ground here, Bruce. Just a minute. Push in, we'll pick this one up. We got a bird right up here. There you go. Got another one right up here. I'll tell you what, Bruce, when those things get up and turn downwind, they're really moving. Yes, they are. Well, I'll tell you, that Brittany is not a trained dog. I mean, she's just running off hunting. And if we're man enough to follow her all day, we'll have plenty of birds. <laughs> now, the good news is... <laughs> she gets on birds. Yeah, she does do that. But if, you know, if you want to come up and hunt, if you want to come up and hunt, you can actually bring your own dog. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of paperwork. You have to have an international health certificate. And of course, the airline Charges these you. days will probably charge you almost like a person. Right. But it's a great place to get your dog on birds. and. Uh, Believe me, there are lots of birds. There are lots of birds. In fact, those went right up in here, yes, and I think did. we can probably pick another one or two out of that. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, if we're man enough to keep up with it. Watch out, be ready. Be ready, Dog's be ready, running. be ready. <laughs> nice shot, Bruce. I got one long one. All right. Back trigger a long one. <laughs> Whoa, well, Marty, I'm empty. Oop, he's right down right there. We can get him. Well, I got two on the rise, <laughs> but they were just right in front of me. Find I had a much closer shot bird. than you did. Find a bird. Now I've got two birds down right here, bird. plus yours, plus this other bird is up the hill right here. Here is an ideal place to show you the food source that these uh, willow ptarmigan eat on. Here we have blueberries. These are low bush blueberries. Here we have some wild cranberries. And here, which is not their favorite, but they're called bear berries. Now, between these berries and this willow, they eat the new shoots and the leaves off of these willow bushes. 
and that's probably the reason they're called willow ptarmigan. All right, Bruce, well done. I keep waiting for one to come out this side. <laughs> and it might yet. <laughs> that's pretty thick cover. Yes. Here, Diana. Atta boy, Bruce. Good double. All right. The bird's on your right. I'm empty. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I saw the flock. They were up about 100 yards in that next clump of spruce. Let's get your two birds picked up. We'll go see if we can get them again. Here's number one, Marty. Oh, here's two, Bruce. I got your second bird. OK. Uh. All right, nice big bird, too. Where'd the... That flock's right up ahead of us, about 100 yards. OK, that was a big flock. Yes, it was. See if we can get back in them. Bird about 30 yards ahead. This wind's got to be giving her fits, Marty. Bird out here in front. Boy, that was a good flock of birds, Bruce. That was a nice flock, wasn't it? I got, the only shot I had, I got one. You get some over here? I got one over here, yeah. Good. Far left. All right, let's get them up. Let's get them up. Those birds went. Went south on us. There's a lot more going on at High Arctic Adventures than ptarmigan hunting. Joe Stefanski has been out checking on his caribou hunters since we've been here. But today, he's offered to fly us out and hunt a different area. Yeah, Bruce, not only uh, great caribou hunting up here, but uh, we have some excellent fishing, uh, probably the best in North America. We start our fishing season around July 1st. Uh, I think probably the, one of the best things, though, that we uh, really uh, haven't uh, marketed is our uh, excellent ptarmigan hunting. What I'd like to do today is experience some new areas, and uh, uh, there's birds uh, 65 miles here long, and uh, we've got a lot of country to cover. So uh, what do you say we get going? And uh, it's a beautiful day, and let's get some birds, huh? Okay. You ready? There you go. Whoo, that was a good flock of birds. Well, how you like that? That was the eye camera. Now that bird went kind of quartering away from me. Now notice that it takes very little lead on a quartering bird. Just a little bit in front and down he goes. Marty, would you put that in the back for me? I'd be glad to. Bruce. Now, we must take a few moments here and talk about limits. You're allowed 10 birds a day with a possession of 30. Now, Marty and I have been fortunate enough. This is our third day of hunting. We've had two days of limits. Now, it's really been good shooting, too. Right. And we actually aren't going to have our 30 bird possession to take home with us because last night the chef at the camp prepared some of the ptarmigan. And I've got to tell you, Bruce, even though it was a darker meat than I expected, it was right. really tasty. It was very tasty. Very much like a sharp tail, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Well, it looks like Joe's up there. Yep, yep, he's waving. Yeah. All right. All right, let's go. I can't tell whether they're up the hill or in front of us, Bruce. Yeah, I can't tell either, and that's what she's trying to figure out. Whoa! <laughs> a little far. There, no wonder she couldn't quite. Yeah, take they were them out. downwind from us. A little us. downwind of us. They'd walk uh -huh. this way. Keep it Downwind. Out. And they went forever. They went almost to the lake. She still acts like, I think we were to there respect this, though. Maybe a couple more this way. Because they could be all broke up in here. Yeah. Ho! Yeah. Oh!
Watch him down. Did you get one? I got one, Bruce. Boy, that was a big flock of birds. I know you you were probably blocked, but... I got one here, but then they came in behind all these spruce trees, so I only had one shot. I had one shot, and it I was mean, a nice, they were moving. Nice flock, though. Let me get my bird over here. Bruce has a big flock up on those rocks. Yeah, look at that big flock see, right see up the head there. Silhouette. That's a nice flock of birds right there. Well, we just got to go chase them, well, though. Just short of limits here. Yeah. I think we need to go make this happen. Look at this. Wow. Come on, yeah. let's go. You don't think they don't see us? <laughs> <laughs> they know where we're yeah, at. She's already, she already got a nose of them. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this. Wow, that's a nice flock. Boy, that was a good flock, man. Even though Marty and I did not hunt the caribou, there were some beautiful bulls taken while we were here. But we did get in some great fishing and shot a lot of ptarmigan. We truly did have a high Arctic adventure. We really did, Bruce. We had a great time, and we can't leave without thanking the staff of Diana Lake Lodge and our outfitter, Joe Stefanski. And we'd also like to thank you for watching the Shotgun Journal. Thank you.